Good morning, one and all. How are you doing? So this is the last in our sermon series on passages, and the idea is there's a passage that truly changed our lives. And so I want to tell you a story of a passage that has helped me so much in my life. But before I've got to give you some context, I am a terribly terribly competitive person. I'm one of those people who can't tell the difference between a grand final and a little game in the park. You know those people? That's, that's, that's my problem. I have that white line fever. You know, the minute you step onto a field, you're, you're willing to sort of step over your mother as long as you can, uh, as long as you can win. Uh, that's sort of my personality. And there's a, there's a little park there's a little park up behind where I live called Horse Thief Park, and, uh, and I go running up there sometimes, and there's this wonderful thing called Strava. Has anyone ever heard of Strava? Right, the athletes in the house know what Strava is. Strava is like this evil concoction of social media and athletics where wherever I run or ride in the world, if someone has made a start line and a finish line anywhere, you get ranked. So any person in the whole world who ever rides across that line or runs across that section, they rank you who's the fastest, right? And so I went for a little run up my backyard and and I I was uh, going up this little hill and there's this new guy in my community group. He's lean and mean and I can tell he runs and his name's Sam. He's over at Rancho right now. Rancho, if you're listening. And, uh, And... Sam told me about a hill repeat that he does just up behind my house. I'm like, cool. So I went and I did this run up this hill repeat and um, I came back down. I uploaded my Strava and I noticed Sam is number one. (laughs) Sam's number one. And so I I waited two days and I went back out there. I took an easy warm up and then I smashed myself on this hill and Steve's number one. (laughs) I wanted to see how competitive my competitive friend was. Within an hour and a half, a message came onto my Strava and it said, heavy is the head that wears the crown. <laughs> now, Sam hasn't run in that park for over two and a half, three years because he moved house a few years ago. But two days later, Sam's number one. <laughs> I'm going to have to do some training because Sam is number one. He beat me by like 10 seconds. I'm going to have to uh, do some work. But I'll, Steve will be number one again. I'll, I'll update you when the time is right. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Well, Jesus broke into my life as a young man. It was an awesome moment in my life. I discovered the reality of God, the real purpose of humanity. Uh, I've received forgiveness and I, I got all this, this uh, transformation in my life. And I discovered that the gospel truly is good news, right? And I was so overwhelmed by that. But then suddenly the dark side of the gospel kicked in. And the dark side of the gospel for me was that I looked around and I saw many of my friends, uh, even family members and people that I loved who were heading to an eternity far from God. And all of a sudden I started to have this wrestle because as a competitive person, I want to win. And I looked into the Bible and it said this awful, awful thing. It said that their salvation was dependent on me sharing the good news. And I thought, no, this can't be the plan. It's a terrible plan. It's an unwinnable plan. And I want to win. And I remember as a young man wrestling and thinking, how, how can we get people to understand what Jesus has done for them, that he is true, that he's real, that he is their only hope. Like, how can we pull this off? It seems like an unwinnable game. And, and through my life, if I look at the community attitude toward Christ and toward Christianity, it doesn't feel like it's getting better, does it? It feels like the arguments these days are that Jesus is irrelevant or that Christians are bigoted, that we're hateful, uh, that the whole religion idea is archaic, that it's anti-intellectual, that people, you know, they need a crutch, they're just not really thinking people, uh, or they don't believe in science. And, and this attitude is sort of prevailing. And so as a person, you can, you can be like I was and start to stress out and think, this, this is impossible. This is too hard. How can we bring the gospel to a world that seemingly just doesn't want it? 
And they're heading on this road to destruction. Even the Bible says it's like a wide path or a great Aussie band once said, a highway to hell, right? Uh, that is this, this idea that people are heading down that line. Well, the good news is, at a young age, I found the passage that we're going to read today. And when I found this passage, it gave me such joy because I found out that if we can understand the basic principles of this passage, if we can begin to apply them in our lives, something really cool is going to happen. We can be a light on the hill. We can be a beacon of light that's going to show the gospel to the world. We can save our families. We can save our friends. We can do this seemingly unwinnable task if we do it God's way. And the other exciting thing is this passage also promises something that was sort of like an unexpected caveat that you can have joy and rejoicing the whole way through. And that was really exciting for me because as a young man, I thought the weight of the world had come on my shoulders when I realized I needed to share my faith. And then God said, yes, the weight of the world has come on your shoulders, but you can do it with me with joy. Are you ready? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much, and we are desperate to see our friends, our loved ones, our co-workers, our communities, and our world transformed with your love and your light and your grace. So teach us this morning so that we can do that job well for you. Amen. All right, the passage is Philippians chapter 2. It's a letter written to a church back in the day. And uh, this chapter is an amazing chapter. In your own time, go and read the first half of Philippians chapter 2. You'll fall in love with Jesus all over again. Uh, it's just a, probably one of the, the strongest passages of displaying the amazing leadership of Jesus, where he was willing to humble himself and, and lower himself in order to save us. It's an amazing passage. Go check it out. And you need to read and understand that first half before you can really understand where we're going today in verses 12 to 18. Because the very first word of our verse is, therefore. And whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, you need to look up. You need to go and see what was said before it so that you can work out what the therefore is about. And in that therefore passage, we hear this Amazing thing. We, we, think it's a, uh, we think Paul actually took a, a song, uh, a song from back in the day on Top 40 Hits uh, about Jesus and recorded in Philippians. But it's an amazing passage which says, Jesus is up in heaven and he sees a crooked and depraved generation. He sees these people that are sinful, that have turned away from him, that have taken his creation, his wonderful idea of life, and they've totally messed it up. But instead of getting all judgy, what does Jesus do? It says he, he decides to leave, leave his wonderful state, perfect community with God the Father and the Spirit, and become like us, humble himself to become a person. He gets down in the muck and the junk with us, lived the perfect life we lived, was willing to take the penalty of all of our sin upon himself and even die on a cross for us. That's what he did, right? Amazing that God would acquiesce to us, that he would humble himself, that he would come into uh, our life in that way to save us and to love us. It's an amazing passage. And then it says something really challenging. It says, you should have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. It says, okay, if, if, if you think that was great, follow it. Do what he did, right? We want to save people. We've got to follow the great example of Jesus Christ. So this first word is, therefore, in light of what Jesus has done for you, let's now learn how are we going to spread the gospel, how are we going to change the world. The passage continues, therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. So Paul says to the Philippian church, well done. You, when I was there with you guys, I could see that you were doing good. I could see that you believe in Jesus, that you want to follow him, that you're changing your life, and, and that's good. But now that I'm gone, it's much more important that you do that. It's much more. Like, it's so tempting, isn't it, that when, 
when the right people are watching that we do the right thing. Is anyone tempted like that? Like on a Sunday, you guys are nailing it. You're all turning up, you're dressed, your hair's done. No one's kidding me getting adultery on the patio, as far as I can tell. I haven't seen any fist fights out in the parking lot. You know, no one's swearing at our cafe staff. Like, you're doing pretty good on a Sunday. But here Paul says, the A game, the much more important, is when you're away, when you're out in the world, when you're out at work, when you're by yourself in the car, when you're down at the shops, okay? It's much more that you're, you're going to obey Jesus and begin to get into the game. What's the game? The verse continues. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Hmm. Now, we have to be careful here. This passage can be complicated. He does not say, work for your salvation. Okay, he said, work out your salvation. Not work for your salvation. Jesus has done everything for your salvation. He's done everything. He came to earth. He lived the life we couldn't live. He made the great transaction. He took all our penalty of sin and he gives us his righteousness. It's amazing. He's done all of that. So we don't work for our salvation. It's been given to us by grace. We don't work toward our salvation. This passage doesn't say if you keep trying and you keep being really good, if you get enough ticks in the boxes, maybe one day you'll be saved. No, it doesn't say that either. So it doesn't say work for, it doesn't say work toward, it says work out your salvation. Now, the word here, the word here, if you go into the Greek, uh, a good picture is like a mime, all right? Now, in Australia, if you're watching, watching online down in the South Pacific, you have to come to America for a minute. Because in Australia, when you buy land, you only own six inches of the dirt, right? The government owns everything underneath. So even if you buy the land and you find out there's all gold under there, it's not yours. Not yours. Come to America for a minute, uh, everyone. Because in America, when you buy the land, if, you, if the gold under there is yours, right? No one can take it from you. All right? So that's what's happened to you with salvation. It says here, work out your salvation because when God gave this great transaction, when he he forgave you, he gifted you his Holy Spirit. And it says he gifts you his righteousness. Amazing. Not, Not try and be righteous now. It's you have Christ's righteousness. But if you want to experience that, you've got to work it out. You've got to get your little pick out. You've got to do some digging. You've got to get the gold. You have it. It's yours. It's there. No one can take it from you. But if you don't use it, then you'll never experience it. And so Paul says here, with fear and trembling, work out your salvation. You have to, you got the gold, but you've got to get it out. And you've got to start to experience it. Amazing passage. Go and check out Romans 1.17, where it says that a righteousness from God has been revealed in the gospel. In other words, all God's righteousness, that very thing that we desperately need in our society, is all being given to you. But it's underground. And you've got to get it out. You've got to work it out. Now, why fear and trembling? That doesn't seem right. If you just found out that you own a gold mine, the gold's all there, and all you have to do is get it out, isn't that going to be like, whoop, whoop? Isn't that an exciting thing? So why why does he say, you've got a gold mine, it's all yours, work it out with fear and trembling? Why does he say with fear and trembling? It seems antithetical. It seems like it doesn't make sense. But what it's saying is that, man, this gift is huge. It's huge. It's the righteousness of God that's being given to you. It's right there for you to access. How sad would it be if God rocked up and noticed that you hadn't even started digging? That you have, you have the righteousness of God at your fingertips through the Holy Spirit, but that you've ignored that and you've just carried on living as if you weren't saved, carried on living as if you don't have access to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords' righteousness, to his way of life. 
And so Paul says, guys, like, we've got to be sober about this. This gift, it cost Jesus the cross to get it into your hands. So this fear and trembling thing says, hey, we need to take seriously what God has handed us because there's a lot at stake. Uh, Let's just take one example of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Let's take the idea of forgiveness. Let's say that you have something really terrible happen to you. Let's say someone hurts you, they do something really bad to you, something really wrong. You've got every justification to be angry and frustrated and all of that. And what we can do in life is we can just respond with our unsaved heart. We can just respond with our flesh, ignoring all the gold that God's put there. And have you ever heard people say things like this around you? Uh, I'm never talking to that person again. No one's ever said that. I've heard that. Or what about, I'm cutting them out of my family. (laughs) I hear that a lot. It's very sad. Think about what that means. Or stuff them. I'm not spending my life investing in that person. Right? So this is the junk, the junk that is in our heart. It's right there, isn't it? It's right there, bubbling up at the surface. And if we don't approach our salvation with fear and trembling, we're just going to let that out. We're just going to let it out. When someone hurts us, we're just going to respond as if we don't have a gold mine, as if we don't have the access to the righteousness of God, right? But Paul says with fear and trembling, he says, When you notice the junk coming up in your life, now that you've seen Jesus, now that you've seen the way he operated toward you, now that you've seen the way he acts toward us, even though we're sinners, he says, when you see that junk coming up with fear and trembling, say, oh man, whoa, whoa, I don't want to live that way anymore when I've got this gold that I can access And it's amazing. Listen to what it says. It says that the righteousness of God has been given to us. So when this person hurts me, when this person has done this heinous thing to me, the scripture doesn't just say he's going to help me give them a little bit of forgiveness. It doesn't say that. It says that he's going to give that person his forgiveness through me. His quality of forgiveness. Not a weak, pathetic uh, whitewashed version of forgiveness, you know, oh, I forgive you, but I hate you, right? That, not a human, not, not a religious forgiveness, not a religious forgiveness where I say the right things so I look all right, but inside I haven't changed. No, no, no. This is like Christ's forgiveness. And this is like I work out my salvation. I say, oh, this person has hurt me. I hate this person. I'm so angry at this person right now. Jesus Give me access to that gold that you say in your word you have given me. Jesus, let me get that out. Change my heart and let me offer this person your level, heavenly forgiveness to this person. And with fear and trembling, I say, everything in me wants to just react like a sinful person, but I've been saved from that. I can work out my salvation right now. I can experience it, right? And this event is so good. This is the Christian life. This is where when junk rises up with fear and trembling, I say, no, no. I've got access to the gold of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I'm going to work out my salvation. I'm going to bring that out. And when you do that, it's amazing. That is when... the Holy Spirit allows Jesus Christ to turn up in your life and people notice it. This is so good. When I was a young man, I hung around school and like a lot of young men, I used to swear a bit, you know, and I used to, you know, try and be cool and that sort of stuff. And then when I became a Christian, uh, I very quickly got the discipline to not swear, right? Very quickly. It's like, all right, that's out for me now. The Bible says be pure. The Bible says let your conversation be good, you know, so got rid of that. But does anyone ever, when they're driving along or they're angry or frustrated, have swear words come up in their head? Right? Yeah. So that happens to me every now and again. Now, the, the fear and trembling thing here is, what's our temptation when we sin in a way that no one notices? 
Our temptation is to go, ah, no biggie. No one saw, doesn't matter. No. Fear and trembling says, no. No, I don't want any junk in me. I don't want any junk. And if something rises up in my life, even something so small like that, seemingly insignificant, why would I allow that to continue when I've got access to the gold of Christ's righteousness? So fear and trembling says, little sins, big sins, all of them. I am going to say, no, I'm going to work out my salvation. I'm going to access the King of Kings and Lord of Lords righteousness in my life. Why? So I can feel better about myself? So I can walk around like, oh yeah, look at that terrible person. I am so much. No! No! We, you, if you've received Jesus Christ, you cannot be in a better position. You are forgiven. You are free. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It can't get any better for you. We don't work out our salvation so that we can feel better about ourselves. We can't get in a better position. We work out our salvation because it's going to bless people. It's going to serve people and it's going to bring people into the kingdom and it glorifies the God who came all the way to earth to go to the cross for my sake, right? So we take it seriously that we want to become like Jesus because there's a lot at stake. Listen, the minds of people in the Western world are not going to be transformed in a natural way. I don't know how good you are at debating. I used to be very good at debating. I went to a secular university and I would debate the socks off people about Christianity. I used to go on the stage and things like that and argue with my peers and I studied philosophy. I studied those things. So I would debate with them and and I would win many an argument. Did they give their life to the Lord? No. How do people give their life to the Lord? It happens in a supernatural way happens in a supernatural way. And so it's so important that we, that we become like Jesus Christ because when people see Jesus in us, something supernatural happens, something they can't explain. Because they could explain my debating ability. They, that guy's a better debater than me. That's why he beat me. They can explain that away. But what they can't explain away is when Jesus Christ interacts with them through a Christian. That messes with their head. And that's when people start to transform. Now, if you get this wrong, you're hearing this, some of you, and you're like, oh man, Steve, I suck at this. I know I've got apparently got all the gold of Jesus Christ, but I never ever access it. I constantly am sinning. I'm constantly making mistakes. Listen, Romans 8 says to you, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? You can keep making mistakes. You can keep forgetting to access the gold. You can keep just letting the junk flow, and there's no condemnation for you. That's how amazing the grace of Jesus Christ is. But guess what? Romans 6 exists as well. So enjoy Romans 8, no condemnation. But read Romans 6, which says, should you go on sinning? By no means. Why would we do that? Why would we do that when we can get the gold out and we can fix relationships, heal relationships, love people, serve people, fix the world, change people's lives and bring people into the kingdom of God? So don't stress out. If you make mistakes, there's no condemnation. You're forgiven and free. But don't don't chill out with fear and trembling. Stay in the game. Stay in the game because it is worth it. It is worth it. All right, the passage continues. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Oh, this is good news. So we're going to work out our salvation. We're going to stay in the game with fear and trembling. We're going to be so serious about our life becoming like Jesus Christ, right? But guess what? There's this other thing at play. God's in the game. Uh, For those who have had kids, kids are such a paradox, aren't they? They're this wonderful gift, but they are so annoying as well. Um, (laughs) I used to try and avoid taking my children to shopping centers. Uh, Society frowns upon me locking them in the car, but that's all right. But it gets to a point, it gets to a point where they actually get cute. They get cute. They grow up enough to do this thing where they can reach 
uh, they can reach the handle on, now, for, I call it a shopping trolley, so I just have to apologise if I slip between America and Australia, a shopping cart, okay, right? Uh, so they get to that point where they can reach the handle, you know, and they start to push the trolley and they love it, right? And, and we as good parents, what do we do? We, we push the little, the little cart, there we go, and uh, we push it and they start to push. Now, this thing is too big for them, it's too heavy, they can't possibly get it done, but they think they're doing it. And as they're doing it, we help, don't we? We see them rolling along. They're about to take out the little old lady. So we steer it. We steer it. And we just send the trolley. And they don't even notice. They're just, woo, I'm doing the thing. This is, this is what this passage says. It says, God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So while I'm taking seriously my transformation to become like Jesus, while I say to the Heavenly Father, what do you want me to do with my life? He says, we're going shopping. We're going to save people, right? And he says, come on in. And when I say, yes, Lord, and I I put my hands on the cart, a cart I cannot possibly push, a cart I cannot possibly get the job done by myself, right? It's, It's ridiculous, to think that I could save the world. But God says, no stress. You put your hand on the cart. I'm going to guide it. I'm going to make sure you don't hit the old ladies. I'm going to put you down the right aisle. I'm going to be in charge here for his good purpose. He's going to get the shopping done. He's going to make it happen. All we need to do is participate, and he is there with us making it happen. And God is so powerful. It's so easy to forget how powerful he is. He is the victor. All history is being ushered toward his end. We're never going to understand all of it, but when we get there, we're going to stand there and we're going to say, wow, what a plan, what a God, what an amazing thing you allowed me to be part of. Why do us annoying pastors keep going on at you about next steps, next steps? You should go to next steps. Next steps is in that room. I'll give you a little gift if you go to next steps. Get a next step. Why, why do we say that? Because every time we do next steps, we're helping people put their hand on the cart. There's so many options that Satan's going to offer you to live your life doing all different other things. But God has told us that if you would put your hand on the cart and go according to his good purpose for your life, you will have joy, you will have fulfillment, your life will have meaning, and you will get to the end of it and say, thank you, Lord, for letting me be a part of this amazing thing, right? So next steps for us is just a way of getting getting your hands on that cart instead of being out in the car park digging holes and doing stupid things that are going to be a waste of time. Get in the game, and God will do amazing things. The irony of all this is people are converted in the strangest ways, aren't they? They're converted in the strangest way. It's when all of God's people are with fear and trembling, trying to get the gold out of the mine so that they become like Christ. They put their hands on the cart. They trust God to guide them into the right places. And little by little, God's revealing Jesus Christ to all these different people. And we don't know how he's doing it, but he's doing it. And when you hear people's testimonies, you realize, what? People's testimonies are so complicated. How they became a Christian was because of a grandmother, then because of a friend, because of an event, because of this, because of that. And this huge storyline is woven together by the master to bring that person into the kingdom. We can't possibly strategize that. All we can do is be like Jesus, trust his plan, be like Jesus wherever we are, and he will use us to get it done. It's complicated. A friend of mine became a Christian. I've told this story before. Uh, He was driving up the coast and his key ring before start buttons was dangling and and the sun hit the key ring and it glinted in his eye. He burst into tears and said, I've got to give my life to Jesus and I've got to repent. And I told him, that's a weird story, dude. Don't don't tell that story. Uh, but, But think about it. Think about it. When that bizarre event happened, And he knew God was calling him. Why? Because of all the Christians who had revealed Jesus to him leading up to that point. Why did he know that he had to repent? 
that he had to seek God's forgiveness and that he had to give his life to him to follow him at that moment. How did he know that? Because God had already revealed it to him through a hundred other people in the lead up to that bizarre moment. And then God just harvested him in a bizarre, inexplicable way. That's how God works. We don't like it, by the way, because we just want strategy to work. You know, We want to be able to sit up in our room and organize, okay, I'm going to run the church like this, boom, 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 and then all the people are going to be saved. No, it doesn't work like that. Why? Because if it was all about our strategy, who would get the glory? We would. Me and Pastor Jeff and Rory would be high-fiving each other, saying, we are the greatest pastors on earth, man. We've saved so many people. This No, we can't ever do that. Why? Because we don't save anyone. All we do is reveal Jesus, put our hand on the cart, trust that he's going to guide us to the right places. And then when we hear people's stories, it's always, you know, it's never, then you, Steve, said this and that and the other and I became, no, it's never like that. It's always, well, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, and now I'm a Christian. And we all stand there and marvel. How did that work? Wow. To God be the glory that he has done this amazing thing, right? If you don't put your hand on the cart, if you don't dig for gold, you're going to miss out on the deepest joy there is in life. The first one is seeing Jesus work in your life, changing your heart. That is fun. I used to be a supremely annoying, awful person. (laughs) I was. I was. And yet, over time, I've become less annoying. No, no. Uh, but God has... God has transformed, has transformed my heart. I'm a different person to what I was. I'm more like Jesus. And I love that. It's a deep joy that comes from that. And then even more, he invites me to be part of his great job. I put my hand on the cart and every now and again, I've been able to be part of God's work in a way where I see someone saved or I see their life transformed. It is the most awesome thing to bring a person into the kingdom of God for eternity. It's so much better than your vacation or your new car or your leather seats or your granite bench top. Those things are all going to wash away when you die. You're going to be in a retirement village sitting alone in a chair and the only thing you're going to own is the things you could bring into that little room. Sucks, doesn't it? (laughs) Bad luck. Bad luck. We're all going there. Life is not about things. Life is about people, right? Right? This is where life is found. Now, Paul's given us some big examples. With fear and trembling, we take seriously that we're going to become like Jesus. We're going to work out this gold mine that God has given us. We're going to grab hold of the cart. We're going to join his plan. Now he gives us a negative example of our salvation. This is really weird, but he says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Oh, Don't you love the Bible? Don't you love the Bible? Listen, if Jesus has done all this for you, if he's given you the gold mine, he's shown you how to live, if he's told you that God's guiding the shopping cart, God's in charge, he's willing and acting and bringing about his good purpose, what is there to argue and grumble about? He's in charge. He's in charge. Everything that happens to you, God is bigger than. Everything that happens to you, God is bigger than. And God's guiding and directing you to achieve his good purpose. So you can't look to the left and the right, all right? You pull into the church parking lot today and you pull in beside a car that's way better than yours. If you start to grumble, I don't want to, like God's ordering that person's life and God's ordering your life. Don't stress. He's got the perfect plan for you. This is hard to hear. It's hard to hear, all right? But it's true. Imagine our youth pastor, Sean Lord. Imagine if you sign up to be a youth leader and you all go on to youth camp and you're both youth leaders and you've got your hand on the cart because you're doing God's work and you're seeing young people get saved and Sean comes up to one of you and he says, dude, I need you to be riding down the water slide with the kids and high-fiving them and loving on them. And you go, yeah, doing ministry with Jesus. I'm in. And then he says to the next leader, dude, I need you to get up into the girls' dormitory. There's a hairball the size of kingdom come. I need you to get down into that toilet. I need you to get it out of there. Both of those tasks, both of those tasks are needed to bring people into the kingdom of God on youth camp. 
And when you trust God is willing and acting according to his good purpose in your life, you don't grumble and complain. You don't say, I want the water slide job. I don't want the toilet job. You say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because Jesus was willing to come from heaven and die on a cross. He's not asking you to do anything that he hasn't done to a far infinitely greater degree. Amen? Amen. So we do everything without grumbling and arguing. Everything. There's no other way, all right? Uh, I, I know you don't like hearing it, but this is, this is the good stuff. Can you imagine if every Christian in our church took this passage seriously? You're on a gold mine. You're going to work hard to get that gold out so that you can become like Jesus. Jesus' life is going to flow through you. You're not just going to give human forgiveness to people. You're going to give Christ's forgiveness to people. You're not just going to give pithy, uh, self-interested love to people. You're going to give God's unmerited favor, God's gracious, unconditional, ultimate love to people. Like You're going to start delivering what Jesus delivers. You're not just going to give people some, some placards of peace. You're going to give them peace. From God Himself. Like, this is the good stuff, and this is where it all starts to roll out. Uh, And when we do this, God is going to use us, and we're going to find joy in our role, and we're going to stop arguing and grumbling. What does Satan want to do to keep you off this main task that God has for you? He wants you to argue and grumble about everything. Isn't that like his first tactic? Right? Instead of us being so concerned with being like Jesus so we can bring people into the kingdom, we're going to start arguing about, do you like that new song? I don't like that new song. Can't believe they chose that new song. What about that Australian preacher? Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> right? Satan, Satan wants us to argue and grumble, doesn't he? He wants that. I don't like our church's new name. Right? He wants that. He wants that because he wants to distract you from the gold mine you're sitting on. He doesn't want you to grab hold of the cart to let God do his awesome work in your life. He wants you to look into the left and the right and complaining about everything else. He doesn't want you. So he's going to distract. He's going to push on you. Listen, you, you type in Rick Warren into YouTube. I think Rick Warren is probably the most palatable Christian pastor you can ever get. He's right down the middle when it comes to theology. He's sound as. He preaches straight out of the Bible. He's a sort of like, he's like, how can you have a problem with Rick Warren? But you just type in Rick Warren onto YouTube. What are you going to find? You're going to find about 400,000 angry Christians Declaring that he's Satan, that he's going to, you know, what? What? I can understand us getting a bit grumpy about some of the fringe folk who are doing things that look a bit dodgy, all right? If God hasn't put you in relationship with them, just ignore them, by the way, all right? But, but why are we grumbling and arguing and fighting amongst ourselves when there's this enormous work to be done? Now, this, yep, be careful. Be careful, you're clapping just a little early because because this enters into your private life as well. All right, if you've lost your job, don't grumble and argue. Put your hand on the cart. Continue to follow Jesus. Live his way. Be in community. Ask for help from the church. We're in community. We're supposed to help one another. We're going to get someone who knows where their job is to get you a job. But don't grumble and argue. Don't get angry at God. He knows what he's doing. If your hands are on the cart and he guides you into a season of losing your job, it's okay. He knows. If you're single and you want to be married, don't grumble and argue. He has a good plan for your life. Trust him. Continue to mine for the gold. Continue to... Follow out his good purpose and plan for your life and wait and see what his next thing is for you. He'll he'll do what he needs to do. If you're rich, that is a tough gig. I think that's one of the hardest gigs. How do you mine the gold when you're so comfortable and wealthy? How do you dispense your wealth righteously? Whoa! Don't grumble and argue. Stay focused. Do what God's asking you to do. And I promise you, joy will come into your life. Some of you, 
around about 80% of your social media posts just disappeared. No more grumbling and arguing. Wow. Wow. Now, if you have a problem with something happening in this church, does that mean that you can't lovingly critique the church? Of course not. If there's issues that you have around here or things you're upset about, please email Rory Eldridge. No, just joking. <laughs> now, listen, I actually, they actually, it's a little joke around the office, but they send, they send all the grumblers to me because if you have the right attitude and you write to me about a problem you have with this church, I know you love this church. And if you went to the trouble to write to me and to say, I have an issue here, I'm concerned about this. I know you love this church, and I take that very seriously, and I will give it the time of day, and I'll write to you. But what I don't take seriously, what I, what I find abominable, is when I hear gossip and grumbling and arguing, that I have no time for. I have no time for. But if you come the right way, with the right attitude, man, I'll give you 100%. And they do in this church, they do, they send them to me, because I love people who love the church. And I'll, I'll take that seriously. But guys... If we're serious about the gold mine, we're serious about getting into God's game, and we're living our life to bring people into the kingdom of God, we are going to be so less worried about all these little things. We're going to be all about the main thing. Passage continues, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Do I have to teach the warped and crooked generation? No, we can see that, right? But this blameless and pure, blameless on the outside, pure on the inside. When I keep mining for the gold, I become more and more like Jesus. And my friend over the road who hates Christians, he's got a problem now. I hate Christians. But that guy over the road, man, he's always such a great blessing in my life. He's blameless. And this is where God starts to work, isn't it? When we're focused on the right thing, that person in the street who hates Christians has got a real big problem. You, you're a blessing, not a curse. You reflect Jesus, which messes with his head, right? So we become blameless on the outside, we become pure on the inside when this is the focus of our life and God begins to win. And here's the passage that changed my life. This is the line when I was so worried, how can we bring people into the kingdom of God Here it is, you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Paul was an athlete. He always uses athletic uh, metaphors, right? We, if we are so focused on working out our salvation with fear and trembling, doing God's plan, trusting him, then we are going to shine like stars in the community and God is going to bring people into the kingdom. And it's so bizarre how it happens. You can't explain it. Just a few nights ago, I was on a cruise ship. Well, our family did a cruise for our Christmas present. And, and I was sitting with my wife. And it was just us two. The kids were in the room watching a movie. And, you know, the restaurants, you're jammed in because you're on a boat. And this family was right beside me. And I'm just chatting to my wife about, hey, what are you going to order? What looks good tonight? Just nothing, right? And this guy starts talking to me. And I'm like, date night, bro. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we start chatting with this family. And, and we get into it and all that. And then the end of the night happens and we're leaving. And he puts his hand on my on my back and he said the weirdest thing he said I really needed to talk to you because you were a, I could tell you were a man of peace I'm like what like that's weird I was talking to my wife about what food I was going to pick <laughs> you, you God will do whatever he wants to do if you just get in the game and trust him and you won't even know I'm like that is There was no, I wasn't praying before the meal, all right? I wasn't being religious or anything. I just, I was talking to my wife. I was talking to my wife about what, whether I was going to have the steak. She's gone vegan. I'm struggling with it. She wanted me to have the vegetarian. Sorry, babe. But as if this is not good enough news, as if this is not good enough news that we are going to win, We are going to shine. People are going to be brought in the kingdom. Paul's words are not in vain. When he stands 
before the Lord at the end of time, there's going to be a multitude of people who have been brought into the kingdom, right? As if that's not good enough news. Look at the last part of the passage. Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I, faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. And so should you too be glad and rejoice with me. This drink offering thing, I can't have time to explain it, but it basically means you've got a big massive offering of a cow and you put a little extra drink offering on and pssst, it just gets burned up. No one even notices it. And, and Paul says here, if your life and my life go unnoticed, if our little contribution just goes unnoticed, in the big scheme of things of all these people coming into the kingdom of God because we were willing to join in and do it God's way, we are just going to be glad and rejoice. And this is the way to live life with joy. Every time you give, you serve, you participate, you're part of the kingdom of God in God's way. Every time someone comes to the Lord, every time you see someone get baptized, you own it. You own it. You were part of it. God used you. To be part of this whole system. And you can just rejoice that you are bringing people into the kingdom of God every time you are obedient to Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Well, would you stand with me while I pray? Lord Jesus, we see a world that is running from you and we see so sadly, we see that the sin and the lies of Satan are playing out in their lives. We're seeing families broken apart. We're seeing relationship breakdown. We're seeing depravity just flow through society as if it's a normal thing. It's like all these kids putting their hand in a fire, Lord Jesus, and we can see that, and we want them to discover you, and we want them to be saved for eternity, Lord Jesus. So help us, Lord. We've, we've been given the plan. We are the plan, and all we need to do, Lord, is work out this gift of gold that you've given us into our lives. Put our hands on that shopping cart and trust you, Lord Jesus. Help us to say yes this morning. Help us to do this seriously, to be, to be passionate about it, Lord. Just make all of those false desires for the worldly things wash away so that we'd be all about you and all about bringing people into your kingdom. We ask that in your mighty name. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If we've never met before, my name's Aaron and I'm the online campus pastor and we love our online audience. And we wanna make sure that our online audience knows that this is a place to feel like home. And we have two places where you can join our community online. As long as you have an internet connection, no matter where you are in the world, we would love to connect with you and make it feel like home for you here. Hop down in the description below wherever you consume this content and there'll be a link to our Facebook group or our Discord server. Pick which one fits best for you. Then join this week, we'll have a conversation. And if you would take a moment, write a review for this or subscribe to us so that you don't miss any of the future content that comes out. I can't wait for you to join our community. Come on home.